welcome back to Chats with Shawnee. This week, we're continuing with our series, South Africans Abroad. Before we get into this week's video, please like this video and subscribe to the channel. Like the video because it doesn't cost you anything, but it does help me a lot. It makes the video more visible to like more people on YouTube. So if you could do that, I'd greatly appreciate it. This week's guest is Melissa in New Zealand. It's so awesome to have you here, Melissa. Welcome to the channel. Please tell the viewers a bit about yourself and where exactly are you in New Zealand? Hi everyone, I'm Melissa and I'm really happy to be here with you guys today. I am from Bloemfontein originally, South Africa, and now I live in the sunny Hawke's Bay in New Zealand. I came to New Zealand in 2018, so it's been almost four and a half years that I'm here in New Zealand and I'm happy to share my journey with you guys today. Oh, thanks so much, Hi. Melissa. Um, tell us, how did it come about that you chose to move to New Zealand? And how did you get there from South Africa? Like, what was the reason? So I worked for PwC in Bloemfontein, so I'm a CA. And um, one day, we visited my brother in Australia. He lived in Australia, and I absolutely loved Australia. So I initially applied for a transfer to any place in Australia for PwC, um, didn't get it, but Auckland phoned up and said, please change your transfer request to New Zealand and we have a job for you. So I did, because it's an opportunity, why would you say no? And yes, so my journey started in Auckland in 2018 um, and later on I moved to Hawke's Bay. Was there any reason why you left Auckland and came to Hawke's Bay um, or did it just naturally like naturally progress to that place? <laughs> um, I hated Auckland, if I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> you can, um, you definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm coming from Bloemfontein, which is, I mean, it's a really tiny place in South Africa and going to a big city and, I mean, number one you go to and you move to a new country everything is new but then you also go to a big city where there's lots of immigrants and different languages and yes everything was really overwhelming and i didn't like the city life so um pwc in napier which is in hawks bay had a staff shortage and they asked for transfers and i thought yep i'll do that um and hawks bay feels like bloemfontein with the ocean so it is great. I love, I love Hawks Bay. So it was a good move. I'm really happy that you mentioned that because a lot of the times we get, we go to a place and we move to a place and we're not necessarily happy in the city that we chose to move to, but then there's always an opportunity to go to another city that maybe you're more familiar with the culture. Like for example, you didn't enjoy like a big city life. You wanted maybe more of like a small town feel. And there's people who love the big city life but they in a small town there's nothing wrong with moving and changing if that's what's going to make you happy so big yes. ups to you for doing that and mm -hmm. for sharing that on the channel because i don't think we have yes. a lot of people saying yeah i didn't really like the first place i went to so <laughs> let me move on yes i think i think when you when you move um to another country you need to be open to be courageous to say, okay, I'm going to start at this place. And if it doesn't work out, it's okay. We are not trees that's planted and you have to be there forever and ever. You can move and it's okay. It doesn't mean that you failed or whatever. It is okay. Um, and it is exciting because you meet new people and new cultures and you see where you fit in better. Yeah. Love it. I love it. So tell us, when you moved over to... New Zealand what was the official work papers that you needed to move over was it a work visa was it a work permit how long does this particular official document last for so um because I trans transferred to PwC which is in New Zealand they are a immigration accredited employer we apply for um uh what do you call it Oh, now I forgot the name even because I'm not on the visa anymore. <laughs> um, but it's an accredi accreditation visa. Um, and that means that you can work in New Zealand, you can stay in New Zealand, um, you can have the health benefits here, um, you can't buy a house. Um, and um, 
that lasts for two years, it was valid for two years, and then you can start your residency process if you want to, or you can go back, or you can reapply for um, the accreditation visa again. Um, the whole process was very, very painful for me. Um, I had to wait a long time when I was in South Africa to get my visa because of New Zealand is really, really strict. And because of health reasons, they also look at all your health um, information, mental health and all those things. So they are very, very strict. Um, so it took a long time to get my visa. I think I waited five months after I got the job in Auckland um, before I got my first visa. So they had to keep pushing my star date out. Um, and yes, most people get visas very quickly. Sometimes it depends on how lucky you are. I'm the unlucky person. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> so with the accreditation visa, you can after two years, like I said, apply for residency. Um, my residency fell, unfortunately, smack bam in COVID lockdown. So I wasn't able to apply. So I had to wait four years before I got my residency, finally. Yeah, we all know how difficult it was getting in and out of New Zealand during COVID. So um, I know that must have been very frustrating for you to experience that. But look at you now, a permanent resident in New Zealand yes. on your way to citizenship. Well done. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yep. said, um, going back to what you said, you said that the um, they wanted some like medical procedures from you, like information as well as like mental health. What would that you had to go through uh, for submission? So we have to do a full medical test, like you go to a GP, a specific GP, they do a um, full checkup and blood, blood tests, TB tests, AIDS tests, all of those things. Um, they also take some x-rays of your chest to probably see if you had TB before. Um, and if you have any mental health um, conditions, you have to see a psychiatrist. So, and it's not easy to get a psychiatrist appointment in South Africa, you wait months. So that is something that I didn't know beforehand. And um, I really think people should be aware of that so that you can plan to, you know, get the appointments that you need. Um, rule, the rules has also changed now. It's not the same anymore. So it might be different now don't really think they will will be that different they will still be very strict on your health and making sure you are sane when you come over <laughs> is that the word yes because it, it makes kind of sense that they look at all that because they don't want someone in their country that's going to have um benefits here if you are um going to be all sick all the time or um you're going to struggle or you know you're not mentally in the good space to be overseas. So it makes sense in a way that they do all those checks, but it makes it really hard for the applicant. At, I can understand from that perspective, because it's already difficult enough moving to a new country. There's anxiety, there's depression that can attach to that situation. I mean, if you already have those existing, you know, illnesses, then it can become very, very dark really, really quickly. Um, so I understand that. And like she said, check out and research and Google. If you want to move to New Zealand, make sure that you have all the information. If you're going to have to go to a psychiatrist and that rule still stands, make sure you check out psychiatrists in your area and if there is any availability for like any assessments that they can do on you. Now, Melissa, you had to do these medical examinations. Did you have to pay out of pocket for it? And how much were they? Um, yes, I had to pay everything myself, but PwC did reimburse me. So in the end, I got everything back. Um, but it was quite a bit. I think it's it's far over a thousand rand um, four years ago. Yes, I think it was maybe all in all three to four thousand rand that I paid for everything. <laughs> yes, it's a lot of money. Yes, that is a lot of money. You don't just have it lying around. And did you also have to pay for like your flights beforehand and then PwC reimbursed you? Is that how that worked? No, lucky they paid for the flights because they do the bookings. 
to make sure you know it aligns with when you want to start work and they also booked for me for a place to stay at for the first week when I arrived in New Zealand so that I don't um just suddenly need a new house um so I think it was a week or two two weeks yes they two weeks they booked a hotel and they also they booked it really close to um, PwC so I could walk so they were really you know they took in con into consideration where you're from um what would you need they put me close to supermarkets and all of those things that you need which was really cool so that is cool. You get really great companies that help you through your process. And then you get a few companies that don't really help you through your process. They kind of just be like, put yourself up and uh, we'll help you in two weeks time when you get paid. So I'm glad, that you are, yeah, I'm glad that you are on, you know, the former side where your company actually assisted you. So now you're in New Zealand. It's been like five months since like you actually got the job. You got your visa. You're in New Zealand. You have two weeks to look for an apartment. How much was you know, your first apartment? And did you have to share or could you get a one-bedroom apartment? I got a one-bedroom uh, apartment because um, I didn't want to share. <laughs> Coming um, so a bit about when I moved, um, I was 26 and it was the first time I moved out of the house. So I was used to sharing with my parents <laughs> and not with random people so I didn't want to share um so yes I did pay for a single bedroom apartment it was a very very awful apartment um but I think it was like three three hundred and fifty dollars a week um it's very expensive um no parking it was on a very busy street it was moldy and wet <laughs> um and when you start out, you have nothing. So I camped in the flat, literally, with other people's stuff, <laughs> um, which is cool in itself because I met all these wonderful Kiwi people that just borrowed me stuff, linen, bedding, um, cutlery, everything. I didn't buy, I didn't need to buy anything. Everything got just given to me so that I can start out. Um, which just opens your heart up to people who are different and don't know you from anywhere, but they are able to help you and they want to help you. Um, yes, so that's really cool. But it is very expensive and Auckland is super expensive. So yes, it's just something you have to be get used to. You know, that's really encouraging hearing what you said because a lot of our guests and even my own experience is that the local people aren't really that friendly and sometimes it's more the foreigners that help you or fellow South Africans so just tell us a bit more about your experience with local people in Auckland in New Zealand and how they were able to help you and welcome you and what have your friendships been like? So yes it is obviously easier to connect with fellow South Africans because um, it's same language, same culture. But when I made the move, I kind of mentally said, I don't want to move move out of South Africa back into South Africa. You know, you want to be part of the Kiwi culture, um, which I think it's really important. If you if you move, you need to move both your legs out of um, South Africa. You can't have one leg in one country and one leg in South Africa. Um, yes, you will meet South Africans along the way. I have fabulous South African friends who are like family. But then again, um, the Kiwi people that I meet along the way are amazing. And I have a couple at the moment that they live around me. They're also my landlords. Um, and they adopted me as part of their family. Um, whether they like it or not, I'm like the adopted child. <laughs> um, yes. So... Kiwis are very open. They're very open to new people. They understand that you are different. They make fun of your accent and words that you do use wrong. Um, but it's all part of getting to know each other and life. Um, and they are they accept people, which I loved. Um, Kiwis, foreigners, we are. You accept where someone comes from. You accept that people are different um, and have different beliefs and different cultures. Because in the end, if you are nice people, it's all good. Um, 
Yes. So I've met lots and lots and lots of great people along the way. And um, yes, lots of South Africans. That's still part of my life. Um, like our friend, our dear friend Imka, that didn't want to be on the panel. <laughs> yeah, Imka, we call you like, I didn't want to be on the channel, but you're actually on it now. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Um, yes. So I would, I would definitely say, you know, yes, go out, see, you know, meet fellow South Africans, um, but don't just focus on meeting people that's from your country. Um, be be fully in the country that you move to. That's something that I would definitely, yeah, recommend. <laughs> Thank you for that advice, Melissa. And you know, you were saying about the Kiwis that make fun of your accent, but now tell me, what does your family say about your accent? Because <laughs> I, oh, I hear something that's not South African. <laughs> I don't think I have a Kiwi accent at all. Um, when I moved to New Zealand, obviously because I'm from Bloemfontein, I'm very Afrikaans, had a very, very strong accent. Um, my English has improved lots. <laughs> um, I know my mum says when she listens to me over the phone, she can hear my voice changed a lot. The way that I pronounce my words is different. Even the ones I pronounce still in Afrikaans that are different. Um, it, in my ears, I don't see that I have an accent, but um, yeah, I hear you. Other people have heard that my accent has changed a little. <laughs> well, when I speak to Imuka as well, a mutual friend, I'm also like, okay, I hear you go. I hear you. <laughs> so for those of you that are wanting to move to New Zealand, it seems like the accent is very infectious. But it's also a very pleasant sound on the air. So don't be worried at all. And also, I can sure you can attest to this. You never forget your South African accent and you never forget your South African food. That's just who you are. That's where you were born. So it doesn't even matter if you say water or water or how do you say water, Melissa? Water. <laughs> doesn't matter how you yep. say it. You're still South African. Because your blood still runs. Green and gold, if I'm not mistaken, right? I was putting yeah. more colors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Melissa, back to the interview and back to all things moving and serious. Um, you've spoken to us about tr moving, transferring, your accommodation, the amazing people that you've met there. What is like your grocery shopping been like? You said you live on your own. So what is your average grocery spend per week? Um, I... Being a CA, it's not great to say this, but I'm not good with my own money. Um, so I like to just spend. <laughs> um, and I know some others, like our mutual friend Imke, um, gives me a lot of grief on how I'm not good with my money. Um, so I would say per week, if you live a good life and you like things that's nice, you can spend $200 a week on groceries. No, Melissa, um, you need to stop that. I'm your new friend <laughs> telling you, you need to calm down. <laughs> you need to stop um, that. <laughs> yes, it's very naughty. Um, but, I mean, other people can get away with, you can get away with $60 a week. Um, and it is doable. Um, lots of people that I know are minimum wage workers and they still have a fabulous life. Um, you, you, it, you are able to do it. Um, I know my first shopping experience in, was in Auckland. Um, I walked up, it was a very hilly road, is that a word? Yes, it's a word today. Um, and I got to the supermarket, which is called Countdown. Um, and I walked in and I looked around at the um, fridges were first, I remember that, and I looked at the cheese and I can't, I couldn't understand the words and it all looked different and unfamiliar. And I think I walked around a little to see what I can buy. And I was so overwhelmed. I walked out and I had no food for that day because I was so overwhelmed. Um, so that happens. <laughs> wow. But yes, <laughs> when you get used to 
what is here it's super easy then it's super easy um, i'm used to i'm used to new zealand food and new zealand things at the moment now so i don't like south african food anymore can i say that <laughs> if i, I go buy something <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to keep that culture alive in this house <laughs> When I go buy something from the South African shop, it's either it's too much sugar or it's too rich or it's too salty. <laughs> yes. See, so your palate has changed since you've been there because of the food that you're used to eating. That's actually quite interesting. Yeah. Yes. Because um, in New Zealand, it's everything is a little bland that they have. <laughs> it's very bland. So I kind of, I'm kind of you getting more used to that now. <laughs> I get yeah. you. I get you. And then tell us, about like i haven't asked this question before on the channel but when it comes to like buying clothes and buying shoes are these sizes the same in south africa or is there a bit of a conversion for example in south africa i wear a size four but when i translate that to u.s size it's a six and a half yeah so is there um, a similar difference or yes yeah, so um in new zealand like our shoe sizes comes in u.s sizes Okay. So, for example, in South Africa, I was between a seven and an eight. We're here, it's a nine or a ten. Um, so that was something to get used to. Um, but I mean, I, you walk in the shop and you just Google. You Google <laughs> what is the sizes, um, and then when you, I mean, when you bought a couple of pairs of shoes, you know, okay, that's your size. So then it's fine. The clothes are quite similar. Um, one thing because I'm a, I like spending money. Um, in South Africa, I had, I was a big Truist fan um, and I had uh, an account with Truist that was six months interest free or whatever. New Zealand doesn't have that. <laughs> so if you buy clothes, you have to buy it cash or on your credit card if you want to. Um, and it's really expensive, really, oh. really expensive. Yes. Um, <laughs> Melissa, also tell us, what is the transportation like? Can we speak a bit more to Auckland with this specific question? Because um, I think that many more people would move there initially than rather going to a small town first. So is, is there public transport? Is it reliable and affordable? Or is the main thing that people use like vehicles, cars as transportation? So if you go to the cities, so Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, it's definitely far more um, affordable to use public transport. Um, so we have buses and trains. Um, I'm not sure whether there's trains in Wellington, but they are in Auckland. I use them a lot. Um, it is very convenient uh, and it is, it is really affordable. So it's a very good choice. But uh, New Zealand's public transport is not that great. It's awesome for a South African coming here and you've never used public transport ever before. It's awesome. But um, if I listen to what other people say that has moved, that has lived in other places with great um, public transport, New Zealand is really behind with that. Um, but I found it really easy to use. Um, the first time I got on a bus, I was very nervous because you wait outside for the bus. And in Auckland, it always freaking rains. Oh, can I say that word? Sorry, guys. Um, it <laughs> always <serious>. rains. In, <laughs> it always rains in New Zealand when you have to wait at the bus stop. So that's not great. Um, and I got on the bus and for the first time, and I was really nervous because you don't know where you scan your card. How does the bus stop? How do they know where to stop? And I just turned around and I asked someone, I've never used this, can you please help me? And the person was super lovely, showed me everything and even told the bus driver, this lady is the first time she's using the bus, please look after her. Um, her next stop is coming in two stops or whatever. And she got off, off of the bus. So that was amazing. Um, so yes, um, I didn't have a car the first, I think three months that I lived in Auckland. So I was, completely um, reliant on public transport. It's not good for doing grocery shopping and those type of stuff because you can't have all your stuff on the bus or the train. But other than that, it's, yeah, it's really cool to use actually. And it's exciting to see all those people and everyone listens to music or watch movies. And yes, it's really cool. You said that 
for the first three months you use public transport. That means after that you bought a car. Yes. And was that expensive? Was it easy to afford and the salary that you were earning at that time? Um, because I know that some people want to get a car maybe within, like you said, the first three months that they're there. And they just want to know like more or less what would the average price of a affordable car be? Like what is the average type of car that they drive in New Zealand? Um, so New Zealanders doesn't really care about a car, what type of car. That's something that you have to kind of, your or how I would um, say our South Africanness are very status driven. Um, yes, they are. And I had to kind of, yeah. yes, I needed, yeah, I needed to kind of let that go because if you're going to be status driven, your car is going to be really, really expensive. Um, so you can get a very cheap, tiny car for $3,000 um, if mm -hmm. you are okay with, you know, driving a car that's from 1990 or 2000, you know, because no one cares. It's, it still runs and it's still good. Um, I, the unfortunate thing is if you're on a visa, they, your finance for buying a car, if you can't afford it, like I couldn't, um, can only be for the time period of your visa. And because I already, my visa was only, I think it was 30 months. And I already, you know, I was, I was there for a while before I bought a car. So the finance was really, was really expensive because <laughs> then you have to pay it off in a year and a half. Yes. Oh, that's it. So that's something to note to well, on. Yes. Yes. It protects yes. the dealership, it protects the bank at the end of the day, but it does not yes. protect your purse or your wallet. You no. probably feel like, oh my word, I'm like paying double for this car every month. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And um, I'm the tallest person in the world, so I can't buy a tiny little car because I won't fit in it. So that makes it that makes it more expensive because you can't buy a little Suzuki and off you go because I won't fit in a Suzuki. <laughs> um, but it is it is affordable and you can do it. And there is people who help. There's there's some dealerships that does special deals for immigrants that comes. Um, so it was easy peasy. It was really not hard. Um, the hardest part for me with buying a new car was to go and fuel up my car because you have to do it yourself. <laughs> yeah, <I was>. um, <laughs> yeah, and to do to check my own car tire pressure. That's the two things that was the hardest. <laughs> Your own tire pressure. Oh no! Yep. I don't even know how to do that. I can pump the gas, but that tight. No, don't ask me to do that. Oh my gosh! Yeah. <laughs> My word. So, it's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, we've spoken a little bit about your process, you know, and getting your residency card. Tell us what is the process to getting citizenship in New Zealand and how long do you have to wait before you can apply for your citizenship? Um, so, when you are on a visa and you can go to a resident visa, uh, you have a resident visa for two years yes two years and then you can apply for permanent residency and then it's another three years until citizenship so in title you have to be a resident for five years before you can be a citizen um some people are fortunate enough to be in the high income salary bracket that when they apply for residency they jump to permanent residency immediately so they skip the first two years um, and other people are not as fortunate like me. So <laughs> you have to wait the five years, which is, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, I'm on my way and everyone's journey is different. Um, yes, the residency process was really easy after COVID and all of those things. Um, it was really easy. And I think the um, permanent residency after that is also going to be it's just an application that you put through. And again, you have to go through all your medical stuff in New Zealand um, and get a police clearance from South Africa, which is the hardest part. Um, but other than that, it's smooth sailing, I would say. And what are the benefits of having citizenship in New Zealand? Um, I know that some things are that you can do like a, 
a work holiday visa in the UK if you have a New Zealand citizenship. So I think you can go for a period of about two years. You can live and work there and then either get a different visa and come back or come back to New Zealand. But what are the other types of benefits that you get as a New Zealand citizen? I um, think the best benefit is having the passport of New Zealand. Of course. Um, which, <laughs> of course. Yes, we take you lots of places where you don't need a visa. Um, you can go to Australia. Um, I think there's lots of, yeah, there's lots of countries that you can go in and out of, no visa required. You can go visit. I think it's just for visit. Um, yes, for me, it's about having that black passport. Yes. <laughs> That's the benefit. <laughs> I remember when I, um, I traveled to the US, I came back home and then I traveled back to the US and <laughs> The lady that was scanning my passport when I went to get like my ticket and everything, she was like, oh, don't come here with that green mamba. And I'm like, you're supposed to help me. I'm in this country. Like, don't tell me that. <laughs> so now wow. I'm going to our passport as the green mamba. Oh. <laughs> but um, Tell me, does New Zealand give its citizens like free health care? Do the kids, are the kids able to go to school for free or is any of those subsidized by being a citizen? So I think the only, you have, we already have those benefits when you have um, residency here. Um, you have, we have su subsidized medical care um, and then little kids, all their medical stuff is free. Um, schools are not free, but um, parents give contributions. Um, but it's it's a contribution that the parent wants to make, so it's that's not a set amount. That's unfair. <laughs> that's unfair <laughs> it's the way. You know what I mean? It's like unfair. Like yes. I want that benefit. <laughs> yes. Um, and yeah, I yes, actually, I haven't researched it. What is the actual benefits of having citizenship above? you know, what I have, what I currently yeah. have. I think it's just the traveling, the traveling is easier if you have the passport um, because with residency visas, you have to be in the country for a, you know, a certain amount of time um, or work here for a certain amount of time, things like that. But we can get, we are, we, yes, our healthcare is subsidized. I'm on KiwiSaver, which is like a um, pension fund, I would say for New Zealand. You can um, be on that when you are a resident and um, you buy a house when you are a resident. So you don't need citizenship to get there. But yes, for me, it's like, why would you be here and go through all this trouble and not do the journey towards getting the passport? Do you know if you'll be able to keep your South African, South African citizenship or if you'll have to renounce it? I know some countries make you do that. And then some countries allow you to have dual citizenship. Yeah, we are allowed to have dual citizenship, okay. um, but I think it's, I think it's more expensive that way because you have to obviously keep your South African passport yes. updated, um, tax requirements, and things like that. But yes, it is the option is available. Oh, and just a uh, sideline information for everyone out there that wants to get a passport to. Uh, well, passport in another country, gain, gain citizenship, and also keep the South African um, passport, you have to go back into South Africa using your South African passport. If you don't, they can find you, and they can deny you entry into your home country. If you come in on, for example, if Melissa came in on uh, New Zealand passport, if I get a US passport and come in on that, they will find me or write a note in my passport. So if you're keeping it, you have to make sure that you travel with your South African passport, meaning your tickets have to be in the name that your South African passport is in. Um, and or if you renounce it, you're going to have to keep a letter with you always saying that you've renounced your South African citizenship and you're sticking with the country that you've immigrated to. That is a sideline information. So, Melissa, you know, we've spoken about the things that we enjoy about moving to another country, meeting new people, being on our own, being independent. And I think myself, as well as all the other guests on my channel, have really shown the positive side to moving. And we've not really spoken about some of the cons 
to it, the things that we experience, sometimes when it hit lows. And I wanted to know, have you hit any of those loans? Have there been times when you felt lonely, maybe that you wanted to go back home? I for sure can say that there have been times, many times that I have felt lonely and, you know, missed my family, especially, you know, during COVID when you weren't allowed to go back home, they weren't allowed to come in. Can you give us a bit more insight into that side of your life? Yep. Um, it's very hard moving countries. It's not easy. Um, the biggest thing in the start that was that bothered me was people back home thought you were having this fabulous time and it's all sunshine and roses and everything's just super fabulous. And in the meantime, you're in this new country where everything around you is different. It looks different. It smells different. Sounds are different. People speak other languages around you that you've never heard before. Um, the most basic things that you normally buy at a supermarket, you it's different. You can't find what, what's the brand that you are used to in South Africa. Um, and all of that makes it really hard to adjust at the start. And you kind of want to have this, oh, yes, everything is fabulous here. And I made it. And it's so great. And I didn't fail and blah, blah. But deep inside, you know, you are really struggling. Um, I really struggled. I think it's because maybe you know I came alone to New Zealand it was the first time I moved out of the house and I wasn't really happy in Auckland so I struggle a lot with my mental health um, and with depression but the when you raise your hand and say I need help there's always people around you that will help and that will carry you but it's hard I'm not gonna lie it's really hard to be here um to always speak in english um people don't understand you sometimes you want to get a point across and you can't because you can't remember the english and then they don't understand you because they don't understand afrikaans and it's simple things it's working in english working with people who doesn't understand that south africans are really honest and straightforward and we are hard people so we offend people quite often <laughs> um so that's also difficult um yes and just getting used to being here and making friends and finding your people and finding your space um it's really difficult and i've had a very very hard tough journey with mental health um I got diagnosed with um, burnout last year and New Zealand did book me off for a, a long time from work. PwC was amazing. They really supported me in it and I got through it. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm all cured and everything is fine. Um, we still, work. It's, a, it's a daily thing to work on to know that what do you want for your life? Make sure that you in in you, you know that you want to go overseas because you want you want something new for you. You want a new experience. You want to work on yourself. You want to grow up a little. You want to be better. And then focus on that. So when you're low and you want to go home and you miss your family and you want to, you know, you want to speak in Afrikaans, you want to eat the South African chocolate or whatever. Remember that you can't. You went to that country for a reason, and um, you need to focus on that. Don't make emotional decisions and buy a ticket and just go home. It's not going to be worth it. Um, if you are happy where you are in your new country, um, always, yeah, always focus on that. Always focus on the people that's around you, and put your hand up when you need help. It's okay to say I need help. Um, I think as South Africans, we are super high performers. Um, we don't want to fail. We don't want to say, I need help. Um, you need help. <laughs> we are people. We can't, we can't, we are not robots. We can't do everything. And when you're in a new country, you need to realize that you need help. And ask, put your hand up and ask, because people are willing to help. People are super caring and they're willing to help you.
Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that advice with us and for sharing your story with us. I know it's not always easy to share something that's so personal, but you sharing that is going to help somebody else that might find themselves in the exact same situation. One thing to give up, enjoying where they are, but just like missing certain things. And like you said, put your hand up. There will be people that will want to comfort you, will want to be there for you. And it might not just only be the people around you physically, but it might be people that's back home, people in other countries that are willing to like literally sit on calls with you, have video calls with you, engage with you, watch a movie with you, like on video chat or whatever. And all those things really, really help. So never be afraid to tell the people you love the people around you what you're going through because you'll be surprised at how much they love you and want to be there for you thank you again melissa for sharing that it was super impactful super helpful and i know it's going to be really imperative that somebody out there hears what you just had to share with us um, and to close off this amazing interview uh, melissa what would you tell somebody back home who wants to move, who, but is uncertain as to whether they should or whether they should not. What advice would you give them to encourage them and to inspire them to make that big move? I would say be courageous. Um, it is amazing if you open your heart and you say, I will jump in and do this. It's amazing what you learn about yourself, your abilities and what you can do. Be courageous and do it. Um, you don't need all the information in the world about the other country. You don't need to know people there. You don't, yeah, you don't have to research. You don't have, have to have everything ready. You, you don't need lots of money to go. Um, if you want to a better life for you and you want to go somewhere um, to see if you're going to fit in there, be courageous and jump in and do it because it's an awesome experience. And you will most certainly love it. And if you don't, it's okay. Then you also go somewhere else or you go back home. That's also okay. But don't be narrow-minded and just stay where it's com comforting and stay in your comfort zone. Yes, you can do it. Be courageous. Yeah, you heard it. You can do it. Be courageous. Thank you so much, Melissa, for being on Chats with Shani. Thank you for sharing your story with us, for all the great advice that you've given us as well. I wish you all the best on your journey and for your journey to citizenship. I hope that it goes smoothly, smooth sailing, and that you'll get your black passport with that New Zealand emblem of the All Blacks. I know that's on there. I think that's why Inko wants it too, because of that All Blacks. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you again so much for being on Chats with Shani. It's been great having you on the channel. And then to everyone else sitting back at home, thanks for watching. And stay tuned for more videos for Chats with Shani. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.